Good afternoon, ladies, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Hall of Heroes. In today's retirement ceremony, as we pay tribute to Rear Admiral Paul Schleiss and his family on the occasion of his retirement after 35 years of dedicated service. The retirement ceremony that you will witness today is prescribed specifically by U.S. Navy regulation, but is rather a time-honored product of the rich heritage of our naval tradition. Custom has established that this ceremony be dedicated to the strengthening the respect for selfless service that is vital to any military organization. It is fitting that we hold the ceremony in the Hall of Heroes. Here we honor each of our nation's armed forces and more particularly, the service of every man and woman who has given the ultimate sacrifice while defending the freedom we all hold dear. Inscribed on displays around the hall are more than 3,400 names of service members awarded the Medal of Honor since it was established during the Civil War. To honor these heroes, the guests will please remain uncovered for today's ceremony. On behalf of our presiding officer, Vice Admiral Retired Ron Boxel, Rear Admiral Schleiss and his family, Christy, Jake, Zoe, thank you for joining us today to celebrate this Schleiss's 35 years of service. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the official party and remain standing for our national anthem and invocation. Ladies and gentlemen, our national anthem. Chapin Gillen will now give her offer the invocation. Let us pray. Lord, we are aware that a surface warfare officer is one of the toughest jobs in the Navy. Surface warfare officers are expected to maintain and operate the most advanced ships in the world and lead by example while developing expertise on everything related to their ship and crew. Today we come to honor Rear Admiral Paul Schleiss, who exceeded all expectations. Thank you, Lord, for his commitment over the past 35 years to not only hold himself to a higher standard, but to instill the surface warrior ethos in those under his leadership. Lord, we are grateful for the numerous hours he spent teaching and guiding others so that they may follow in his footsteps. Today, we are here to express appreciation to Christy, Jake, and Zoe for the known and unknown sacrifices they have made to make this day possible. Thank you, God, for their tenacity and resilience through numerous transitions. We ask you, Lord, to bless this ceremony in our time together. This is our prayer, O oh Lord. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Rear Admiral Paul Schleiss will now introduce today's presiding officer and guest speaker. Uh, 
All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Welcome to the Pentagon and the Hall of Heroes. It's my pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker, Vice Admiral Ron Boxel, a veteran of more than 35 years' service in the Navy. He commanded at every level, including USS Kearney, <laughs> USS Lake Erie, and Carrier Strike Group 3, John C. Stennis Strike Group. Ashore, he served two tours at N96, including as director, and at the Joint Staff J-8, where he served as, as a primary overseer of building DOD's over $700 billion at that time budget across three fiscal years. Admiral Boxel is a proud Penn State Nittany, Nittany Lion, yeah. <laughs> uh, a pretty damn good golfer, and you know seems to get a little more handsome and a little younger looking every time I see him, <laughs> which funny. is, yeah. Um, but uh, we're thrilled to have him here today, along with Wendy. Okay. Sir, okay. ladies and gentlemen, Vice Admiral Retired Ron Boxel. A lot of paperwork up here. Okay. Well, it's good to be, see so many great friends who I've given bad turnovers to. So, uh, it really, really doesn't make me uncomfortable at all. Hey, today's a great day, bittersweet. We're already starting. Uh, you know, we're celebrating a lifetime of service and sacrifice in support of our Navy and our nation. Really, I'm talking about Christy, Zoe, and, and, and Jake. Uh, we're also going to talk about Paul. Uh, there will be some trips down memory lane here that will be crying. There will be laughter, some drama, most of it by me. <laughs> You're going to hear some common things. Some people that Paul worked for were some of our most successful leaders. And one of those guys that, that all of those folks wanted always working for him. You're also going to see that there's folks who worked for Paul who are now leading our Navy at the command level and beyond. And there's also, you're going to hear a theme of the Navy disrupting our lives day to day in the worst possible way, in the way this family turned lemons into lemonade. But it really wasn't hard. If you go back to thinking where Paul grew up, Wisconsin, Sturgeon Bay, on the water, shipbuilding town, you know, he went to, you know, he's a Wisconsin all the way, beer brats, Packers, you name it. I mean, he's classic, right? And it really is no surprise he ended up going to Marquette in Milwaukee for his Navy ROTC for four years. Graduates from there. Now, he was a three-sport athlete, and one of them clearly was not golf, I'll tell you. <laughs> but we also had, you know, he was also class president and, you know, so many other things that, you know, we made him successful also at the flag ranks. So he gets off to his first tour after graduating from ROTC and goes to what every dream job is, an o a ammunition ship out of out of, the, out of uh, San Francisco Bay. And, you know, I'm sure that's what you asked for on your, on your sheet, right? Yeah, no. But he went to be the electrical officer in, in OXO. Those are jobs that are the same no matter what ship you're on. And then he also went to be the navigator. And while he's there, some things happen. The Desert Shield started, you know, Iraq invaded Kuwait. And while you're there, he gets back, turns right Iraq, goes back again for a second deployment. Uh, this time, Desert Storm, we're on the offensive. And then, after Mount Pinatubo, he had to go back and rebuild. Uh, they had to take all the stuff out of the magazines uh, from Subic Bay to. So it was a pretty productive tour, a lot of sea time, water under his keel, and it was rewarded with one of the best tours you could possibly get after that, which was the fire control officer on the USS Antietam, which, you know, big difference in, in jobs. However, he gets there, goes on deployment, does a great job, everything's going well, but he does a deployment with the Vincent Strike Group, and then what happens? You know, because he's got all this Aegis training, this new Aegis training, they sent him to be the dry dock coordinator for 10 months in the Long Beach Naval Shipyard, which was also on your preference sheet, I'm pretty sure. And, and we reward that tour with accelerated department head tour. So, you know, there's a time when I was there, when Dave and I went through, you know, we, were, we had too many department heads and they were throwing us out. Somewhere between us and him, they now we threw too many of us out. So uh, now he's pulled forward. He goes to pre-com USS Hopper. All right, which is a DDG-70, but uh, little did he know how that tour would change his life. He ended up getting the job as the weapons officer, department head, and at the same time, in 1996, he never knew his worlds would collide with this one Christy Cott. Now, Christy, a naval officer in her own right, she grew up, now she's from uh, it's north of Chicago, and she decided in, when she was in seventh grade, she went to the Naval Academy and said, that's where I'm going. However, she didn't get accepted right away, and she went to Michigan Tech, but she showed up with a shirt that said, Temporary Michigan, er, uh, Michigan Tech Student. 
And the next year she did, in fact, started the class in 91 and became, uh, graduated in 95, went to be a division officer in the USS De Sullivan's, which was number 68, a few months ahead of the Hopper, which were both in Bath, Maine. You see where this is going? Yeah. <laughs> well, here's what you didn't know. Because you're out there six months at a time, you always, as the new WEPs, as I did this in the pre-com, you go to the previous ship to figure out what's going on. They're in a Bravo trial, and Christy's doing, she's the surface coordinator in the, in the combat system suite, and he's there visiting the WEPs. Yeah, it's, you, know it's, you know where this is going, right? Yeah. <laughs> so Paul, worst move ever, okay? He takes out his, a stick of gum after one of these practice things, pulls out a stick of gum out of a thing, and pulls it out, like props one out, point, and gives, hands it to Christy and says, uh, would you like some gum? Pulls this thing out, there's no gum inside. <laughs> what a great trick, Paul. <laughs> Christy, what were you thinking? Anyway, so we moved to the next, you know, we moved from there, and he says, okay, let's give him another shot. There's a Halloween party on the base, we're gonna go there, and everyone shows up in a costume except for Paul, right? <laughs> Strike two, but she's got something she sees in this guy, I don't know yet, but we're getting there. And finally, the third time he actually went on a real date, his supply officer, uh, Patricia Day, invites him and, and Christy over to go to dinner. They hit it off and start dating in Bath, because you know, Slim Pickens up there in Bath, I get it, Christy. <laughs> but, my apologies to anyone from Bath, sorry. <laughs> anyway, so she ends up realizing that, you know, this is the guy, so six months together, and then all of a sudden, Navy kicks in for disruption, all right? I told you she's going to Sullivan. Sullivan's home in Mayport, Florida. Paul's going to the Hopper in Hawaii, right? Uh, that lent itself very well to a nice near location romance. And uh, so they, they wrote these letters, really heartfelt letters back and forth for years, uh, you know, for while they're dating and all this stuff. And what does Paul do with the letters? You'd think you'd keep those for posterity, right? No, he saw this Seinfeld episode, that says, you don't keep anything past two weeks, and they chucked them all. <laughs> Christy, do you still have your letters? All of them. See? <laughs> I'm sorry, maybe I missed the theme of this thing. <laughs> anyway, let's get back on track here. So, uh, well, Christy actually went back to Great Lakes. Uh, her mom fell ill, and uh, she, while she was there, Paul was visiting her back and forth, They're trying to get some together once in a while. And sure enough, this romantic man here at the C-26 gate at Chicago Airport decides he's going to ask her to marry just before he gets on the plane. <laughs> you had your chance. You had, like, I mean, you saw it coming. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, bottom line is it all went, it all turned out fine. She said yes. He said he was going to say, in case she said no, he wanted an easy exit. I was like, okay. Anyway, but he had a great tour and uh, eventually they got back together. And the only problem is they had to set a wedding date when it gets ready to go. You know, of course, you want to do that when you're on sea duty. So he was supposed to detach in April. And they were going to get married in May at the Naval Academy. All, all good. Except that he got extended to September, <laughs> which is fine because they're only deploying to the Western Pacific and Australia. So <laughs> no problem at all. But he was able to get away. She had a backup in mind, which I recommended strongly uh, that she do. And, and it turns out he made it. He got there, spent a week or so with her, and then back to deployment, uh, finish it out. So nice romantic, you know, honeymoon. Congratulations. <laughs> Fortunately, she did get a job in Crystal City working here, and he got a job in N96 and 86 back then working for Tom Roden. Uh, first stint in uh, uh, working for missile defense in N86, then now 96, uh, and immediately went back out to sea as the XO in USS John Paul Jones. A great ship. He reported to John Paul Jones when they were home ported in Hawaii, moving to San Diego. But he, so he picked the ship out, out there, wrote it back, turned over, and eventually they did get back to San Diego working for. Where's Dave? Dave, there he is, Dave, Dave Steinel, good. And that's actually where we met. You may not remember it, I was very forgettable. But it, we had a uh, first Fridays uh, at his home in Coronado and that was, uh, you'll hear this theme over and over again of you know, the type of environment that Dave created that Paul also emulated and now his officers are doing the same thing. So he goes to John Paul Jones, works for Dave and Roy Kitchener. Uh, they lived in Studio City in LA while uh, Christy was pursuing an acting career. You can go still you know, go find her on some episodes of JAG. I did, it was pretty, it was good. <laughs> you did the right thing getting, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, it's all, you gotta, you gotta give your time too. I mean, anyway. But anyway, uh, so it, the really good, great thing about John Paul Jones, one of the best ships in the fleet at the time, not surprising with that type of leadership. Um, but 
I got asked Dave to write some notes. He said, hey, Paul was an incredible XO on top of his game in every area, war fighting, ship handling, admin, leading sailors. He ran the ship completely and worked me out of a job. That's kind of what you're supposed to do as the XO, and few captains let him do that. He said, oh, but he actually got a chance to do it because Dave was in Mazatlan, Mexico, and got a little of Montezuma's revenge on the trip back, and was stuck in his room with an IV, and apparently, uh, you know, he just said, hey, we're getting, getting underway. So Captain Schleiss, Schleiss got underway and uh, took the ship back, no problems, while Dave recovered. Couldn't be more than five feet away from the head, apparently. <laughs> but it was all good. Had a great ship. He also said that uh, he, they, they did win the Spokane Trophy, the Arizona Memorial, and, and the best words that a CEO could say is, I had a dream CEO tour because I had a dream XO. So we roared that tour with where we want to send our best, which is Millington, Tennessee. <laughs> it, it sounds bad. It really is true, all right? Dan Holloway here was the first 41 and Tony Curta working there. I think every one of you people have been at first 41. I know you've been there. I know you've been there. I, yeah, you've been there. I brought you there, right? Yeah. <laughs> Jim Kilby was there. I mean, this is, a, this is a who's who. I mean, Aiken, Evans, Fowler, Welch, Black, Kilby, Curta. This is a who's who. So I'm serious. It's a great place to go. It's just in Millington. Um, <laughs> So anyway, I did that his two years, worked in the P-Zone, crewed Des Pack placement. I was the Lant placement guy, and then I, got, I had to become the deputy, and you became the deputy. So look, we're almost like brothers. <laughs> almost. I would have never done the gum trick, seriously. <laughs> so anyway, great tour there. They had a good time. Comes back, goes to joint staff, because no good deed goes unrewarded. Uh, does his time, but it's actually the first time you really get to all be together for a long period of time. So that's really good. Moved into Dave's house in Delray. Um, and the best thing about that tour was uh, Zoe was born in May, and I missed where Jake was born uh, back when we were on the first tour, when we were back in, uh, with, 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 uh, in 86. So uh, welcome. So uh, good to have you here, Zoe. And uh, Jake, sorry, you were actually born, but I didn't mention it. <laughs> I'm sure. Things will get better. All right. So then he goes to Desron 7. Again, all excited. They're going to go to Desron 7, which at the time was in San Diego. And they're like, oh, it's great. We're going back to San Diego. It's going to be great. And uh, sure enough, he goes, goes out there and goes to report. And they have this big thing called a uh, Tomodachi, which was when the Japanese uh, had the earthquake, tsunami, and then the nuclear accident. And uh, it was a big problem on, out in Reagan. Everybody was real tough. So they held him up. But then he got to be the Commodore for the deployment. He returned to San Diego. Got ready to take over. You know, they split duties. He was the ISIC while they did uh, the Pacific Partnership. And uh, somewhere, he's at a, somewhere on the beach in San Diego, someone says, hey, I heard Desron's going to Singapore. It's like, no, no, no. I'm going to be the Commodore, and no one said anything to me. Sure enough, three weeks later, he had orders to Singapore with the whole rest of the group. And he and Christy packed up everything they had and found out in November, in December, they're out there with literally nobody there. Um, first group of the Desron there. No furniture, no stuff, and they hosted all the folks there that got stuck there and for the Christmas, and there's some notes about that as, as, uh, as you read through. Fortunately, he had a guy named Kacher as his, as his deputy. Not a bad guy out there. He's the seventh fleet commander right now, and uh, he blew up my phone over the weekend trying to tell me all the stuff that Paul did. Oh, like I said, my speech is longer than it should be anyway, but, you know, it's Paul, uh, or it's uh, Fred, and... Uh, he wanted to make sure, he said, he has served as Paul's deputy at Desron 7. I've never seen a leader, and Christy led here as well, create a sense of family and purpose for a command more naturally and skillful than Paul. He moved our team, taught us to operate and engage through Southeast Asia, and Christy and Paul opened their homes to all of us. He made it fun, from the first Friday Ultimate Frisbee Games and happy hours at the Terror Club to Big Lebowski movie nights at his house uh, so Desron 7 spouses could have a night out in town. Grilling his world, famous Milwaukee beer broke, beer soaked brats, to building a command team that is still making a difference more than a decade later in Seventh Fleet. They remember having a beer in Thailand, thinking how great things were. And then he gets this email from Christie threatening to move back to San Diego because the monkeys that lived in their yard were harassing their family. <laughs> These are just the normal types of things that happen. I don't know. Anyway. But the other interesting thing about that tour was, he, when he went to uh, Thailand while he was there, he's the only naval officer to command an international exercise in a country where an active military coup is going on. <laughs> I had that similar thing happen when I was in the Philippines, and you don't know which side you're on. You're like, I think you're the good guys, but I don't know. 
And it said, the, the, this officers would say, no matter how bad any news was, you could always distract the Commodore by talking about the Packers. <laughs> hey, Freedom just released a C4 Kazrep on their splitter gear, but I hear the Packers are going to draft Devontae Adams. He's like, yes, yes. But they took care of the whole Desron 7 staff like they're a family, invited the whole staff over for his house, and who knows how many other uh, places they had gone for... Uh, buying hamburgers for the uh, 27 hamburgers at the airport because the food was tough to get to in Changi, apparently. Awesome. Well, Charlie reported, I think somewhere in here I missed the page because I, I somehow didn't tell you, you your whole command tour. We didn't miss that, didn't we? Did we talk about that? You want to hear about that, don't you? Yeah. No, we'll come back to it. We, we got so lost in Millington. Anyway. So the best thing about, I'm going to go back to his command tour. Sorry, I apologize for this. It happens. I got home at 2 o'clock. This whole, this whole flight thing this weekend was not good for me. We were driving up to my dad's. We ended up getting here. So I, I, I'm sorry. But anyway. Uh, so C.L. Halsey, 97, thought he was going to D uh, Decatur, right? Another reslate in the end game because their MRG blew up. Is that right? Yeah. Front page, New York Times. Next thing you know, you'll say, oh, glad I'm not going to go to Halsey. Well, sure enough, Millington folks, send him to Halsey. And he gets there and, uh, you know, Certainly while he's trying to move, Christie's got a prom uh, projectile vomiting Jake somewhere trying to move uh, the household goods. You know, your stock's just going through the roof here, Paul. <laughs> but he did end up uh, deploying with a Peleliu ESG in spring of 2008, and his future CNO was the boss, Mike Gilday, uh, for most of the tour. Here were some great comments that some folks that worked for him said. Captain Schleiss loves a well-placed curse word. <laughs> he also loves a poorly placed curse word. <laughs> He and Christy hosted these first Fridays at their bungalow in Coronado. They'd have the entire wardroom over for the first Friday of every month. When the first one rolled in, everyone's like, right, you got to go to the captain's house? It's not required, but it is the captain, right? Second invite came in. We couldn't believe we had to go do it again. And, and then when the third invite, invite didn't come in, they all shut up his door anyway, asking if it was on. <laughs> this was the blueprint for leadership that, that they may have not forgotten and have tried to replicate and emulate in command. But uh, it's really humbling when you see the, the captain of your ship having his wife tell him to go pull the uh, pigs in the blankets out of the oven, right? <laughs> so they, they loved it. And then you got reward with your joint tour. So now I'm back on track, so just stick with me. So after this wonderful tour in the Desron, he comes back and now he goes to N96C, which N96C is Director of Service Warfare working in the weapon shop. So that's a big deal for us because it was a time when we we're trying to get more distributed weapons out to the fleet. Uh, Charlie Williams really hooked him up because he was his boss at CTF-73. He just made flag in the same job, went out and got relief, came back to the empty seat, and I don't think he did any N96C turnover out in Singapore. So, so nice job, another empty seat turnover. You'll hear that theme again, Gene. Um, but uh, he worked for Pete Fant and a guy named Boxall, and uh, we had a great time in that tour. He, N96 was just an awesome place to work. Uh, he had a great group. J. Rob was there. Jeremy Robertson, the CEO of Kearney. We had uh, Doug Rob was there. Terry Bohannon was the, worked there. I mean, this is an A team, and they did some incredible stuff. They put CRAM out on the destroyers out in out in the uh, at the Met at the time in Rota. And fast forward, that CRAM on that ship is one of the shi systems that he used to defend that ship when Houthi rebels were shooting at it here just a few months ago. And so it's funny how this stuff turns around. That's why we put operators in the Pentagon to go out and work in these jobs so you can go back and you don't never leave without the warfighter in mind. But anyway, also did things like uh, we had a DG-1000 that had no gun on it. We, everybody's, oh yeah, it's got a gun, right? We had this, there was no gun for the DG-1000. So, you know, Paul and Jim Kirk and others, and, and Bill, I think you were involved in that, uh, we had Got it, this Project Lemonade, we called it. You know, we got lemons, let's make lemonade. And sure enough, they came up with this idea of putting this prompt strike weapon on the, on the bow of the ship. So first, you know, the submariners had that all in their platform or in their uh, portfolio at the time. We're like, we should really think about getting this on surface ships as well. And sure enough, and here we are a few years later, and we will be, have the first Navy long-range hypersonic weapon conventionally launched from ships here in the, whenever the POM allows. Right. It's pretty good. It's on track. It's on track. <laughs> Jimmy, I'm not telling you to reveal anything, but it's kind of important. Anyway, but amazing stuff. They also put on, we had a naval strike missile that we were able to get, a new Navy strike missile that we uh, built by the Norwegians. And although we didn't build a missile for a couple of years, 
uh, he was a, we were able to swing a deal with the Norwegians to actually we'll gladly pay you Tuesday for some naval strike missiles today. <laughs> and you know, we got Long Island Polino to, to hop on board and say, yeah, I'll sign up for that. And so uh, we got him out there in less than a year on the ships, uh, which is an amazing new capability for the ships. Again, that background from the Desron and from LCS uh, really hooked us up. He also had a great uniform in the Pentagon he always wore. You can see it any time. They called it service dress slice, which was TiVo's cargo shorts, t-shirt, and a ball cap. And literally, I don't, I don't think I ever saw in much else. Even on the golf course, I think you should roll out of that. Anyway, they'd remind you, you'd go into Terry Bahannon, she'd tell you, you'd come up with all these great ideas, and then she'd tell you why we tried that and we didn't have any money for it, so that was always fun. But really, I think one of the best things we had was this surface Navy golf thing. So we, we have some surface Navy golf members here. I know uh, John Mustard, me, Tom Dicey. We're the kind of the newer, you know, we're on the team now. But the previous team had Jay Robb and Doug Robb. It was all N96. It was me, Jeremy, Doug, and, and Paul. And we were not really ever even threatening. <laughs> um, at the time, you know, I didn't know Paul that, you know, because Schleister's Schleiss. And after playing golf with him, I never forgot. <laughs> never forgot. <laughs> but we were all thrilled when Paul did, was promoted to rear admiral. Off he went to NAVCENT uh, out in Bahrain. He relieved Gene out there. And, um, you know, lived in Amwash on the beach. Uh, all, everybody learned to paddleboard, incurred, including their dog Wrigley, named after the gum, of course. <laughs> Actually, the dog, huge Cubs fan. She's turned him into a Cubs fan, which is great. Also a Navy fan, right? Not huge, but at least uh, acceptable, right? Okay. There's the huge Cubs fans in the family. Um, yeah, all in all, you know, so he went through that job, you know, went, went out there tough. It's always tough. Worked for guys like uh, Kid Donegan, Long Aquilino, Sterno Sterney, Jim Malloy right here. Uh, family trips to Paris, London, Italy, Sri Lanka, Oman, UAE, Jordan, Egypt. You know, hey, if you're going to be out there, right? And so these are the things to balance all that lemonade problem, right? So I uh, hope you enjoyed some of that. He went right from there. We were thrilled to go... Uh, See that he got picked up to go to Carrier Strike Group 10, the Eisenhower Battle Group out of Norfolk. Again, a couple of curves thrown his way a little bit. This is just pre-COVID before anything happened, but at the time, Woody Lewis and Second Fleet decided that this was the time that we were going to test out our logistics and our ability to just come home, not even, not stop, just, just kind of re refit and refuel and get ready to go from deployment without coming back and having a, a, de a deployment stand down. And then COVID hit. <laughs> so... Uh, 208 days later, when uh, Ike left their pier in Norfolk, they finally came home from that deployment, setting all kinds of records. Paul was in there most of the time, ended up turning, up to, turning over to another great American and Carney CEO, Brendan McLean. But that whole idea that we could have deployed a carrier strike group for 208 days at sea and maintain and sustain them is just a testament to your leadership and your team and a strike group and all those ships and sailors that just make it happen every day. Uh, but again, no good deed goes unpunished. And back he comes as the director to N96. And he turns over to another empty chair left by Gene Black. <laughs> I say that, but you weren't that far. It was, it was fine. It wasn't that much to turn over. Here's, the turnover goes something like this. You don't have enough money, and you have a lot of ships to pay for it. Everybody wants to buy everything, right? It was something like that. So yeah. you don't need to turn over, right? Just like yours. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I at least showed up for it, okay, yeah, 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 okay. I knew that was gonna happen. You see, you can't, you can't throw too many darts from here. All right, so, but, then, but as N96, those tough choices we all had to make along the way, and, and Brad, you're not helping, and Jimmy, you're not helping, <laughs> not helping. Uh, you all, you know, we did make serious progress in the DDG modification, and again, this is another thing that's gonna make our whole fleet better. Uh, we made really tough choices on the cruisers. Everyone here, I'm a former cruiser sailor, you've been a cruiser sailor, most of us have been cruiser sailors in this couple of rows. We hate seeing them go, but we, when you really know the details on what it takes to keep them here and what we have into them and what the opportunity cost of what you're not getting by doing that, it becomes uh, uh, easier to swallow, never easy. Uh, the right answer is getting more money to do it. We didn't get it. Uh, that's just the way it goes, and uh, those are the tough choices we have to do. But we still are moving towards a fleet that's more distributed and unmanned, uh, medium and long-range uh, unmanned surface vessel, large surface vessels. Um, and we're also correcting a lot of those fleet challenges with DG-1000. We need that ship to be out there and continue to move with prompt strike. Short stint at N-72, 
back to N9I. Here we are, kind of your old job. Uh, nice working for your boss who had your job, isn't it fun? Anyway, <laughs> now Jimmy's fantastic, and uh, and he does. He's the right guy for it. And but it, you are kind of a senior among equals because you kind of bring in the surface, the air, the subsurface, and the expeditionary portfolio, and try to somehow manage something that can get through the building and across the river. In summary, Paul, I have to say it's been a hell of a run. If you think back to that high school kid from Sturgeon Bay who joined Navy ROTC at Marquette almost 40 years ago, did you ever think your journey would end here? Some parting comments by those you've left. Humblest flag I've ever met. Ruthlessly loyal to the Navy and those of us who worked for him. Smart as a whip. Tremendous husband, father, leader, patriot, mentor, and friend. There's nothing better you can say. That's, that's the ultimate compliment. At the end of the ceremony, you'll hear the reading of the watch where you'll symbolically turn over this responsibility to a Navy <clears throat> that is rife with leaders whom you have groomed. It'll be read by the former CO Carney, J. Rob, a division officer who cut his teeth as a J.O. under your command in Halsey and your continued mentorship in N96. J. Rob and Carney's flawless performance in the Red Sea, enduring over 50 attacks by drones, cruise missiles, and ballistic missiles from Iran-sponsored Houthi rebels have made them the pride of the fleet. J. Rob and many others of our best officers who have watched you, learned from you, and want to emulate you. you. They will lead our Navy for another decade or more. You can leave this Navy with a great sense of pride and satisfaction. You have shaped the future of the Navy and our surface Navy for years to come. You and Christy raised two amazing children who seem to be no worse for the wear for all of the Navy's disruptions to your lives. <laughs> you know, Jake's going off this year to Florida State and Zoe's going to be a junior or a sophomore at Bishop Ireton, and we're very proud of both of you. But most importantly, your legacy will live on in the people who will lead the Navy you love. Christy, good luck. <laughs> if you don't know what I mean, talk to Wendy, all right? He's all yours now. Wendy and I wish you both, and Jake and Zoe, fair winds following seas. And Paul, uh, John Mustin, and Tom Dyson, I know you have no excuses to bag out on the next SNA golf tournament. Congratulations and God bless you all. Grace be, sir. I use that Packers every time uh, I'm in trouble or need some, uh, some, uh... Sorry, I should close you sooner. Yes, sir. <laughs> I got bad news. I leave with Packers, yes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're my Paul Schleiss, United States Navy. Okay. Well, not all my, pretty much all my materials used up, but, um, you know, I, I do have a few people to say thank you to today. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to a great Navy day, even for a Monday. Uh, Christy, Jake, Zoe, and I want to thank you all for making the time to celebrate this day with us, and particular thanks to those who traveled from near and far, navigate the Pentagon Security Labyrinth, and be here in the Hall of Heroes with us. Special welcome to Ivy Kilby. Uh, we're thrilled you could join us since we met in the tall cotton of Millington uh, more than 20 years ago. We've counted you among our very best friends and mentors. We know Vice Chief wanted to be here, but he's extra busy running the Navy while CNOs on travel and all the DCNOs are here. So <laughs> we're, we must be losing money upstairs somewhere. Um, <laughs> um, to the assembled flag and general officer, wardroom and spouses, active reserve and retired, Members of our senior executive service, thank you for taking the time out of your business schedules to be here, and more particularly for your support and camaraderie all these years. Each of you have, a, have positively impacted and influ, influenced Christie's and my career in life, and we are forever grateful for the friendship and fellowship we've been so fortunate to share with you. We are in your debt. Mick Ponhanea, good to see you, shipmate. Uh, and Evelyn, thanks for being here with us. We, we were blessed to serve with you in Bahrain. At, at, you, uh, Mick Pond was the fleet master chief out there. And again, here at OPNAV, our Navy is stronger due to your enduring and dedicated service. Great to see you, brother. My family is here. My cousin Patty, 
Uh, husband Glenn and Nicole Sugiyama made the trip from Chicago. We've been so happy to reconnect with you this past year. Unfortunately, it's been at memorial services uh, for my parents, but we appreciate you going many extra miles to keep our family ties strong. Also in from Chicago are Christy's childhood friend Denise and Ted Galastianos. Pretty close, uh, but great. Thanks for making the trip. Great to have you guys. A special thank you to all who worked to plan and execute this event, the NNI front office staff, my EA and MC Boomer, uh, Team 9I, especially Christian, Juan Juan Diaz, Lieutenant Dave Debenham, Lieutenant John Anderson, the incredible U.S. Navy Band. Well done. <laughs> Chaplain Gillen, thank you. The Pentagon Force Protection Agency, who we couldn't have done this without our ushers. The Navy chefs, you're going to get a taste of their food afterwards from the SECNAV mess upstairs. All who helped assemble the program and, and the public affairs team and more. Thank you. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you all so much. Please join me in, in thanking everyone at did. Admiral Boxel, thanks for your remarks. You've been an incredible friend, mentor, golf partner, and uh, you know an occasional uh, wine taster uh, with you and Wendy, and we look forward to more times with you guys, good times going forward. Uh, we have to watch our language a little bit. The United States Congress is represented here. Uh, our next door neighbor, uh, Jay Valario, is somewhere back there in the back, and uh, he's actually here in a personal capacity today, so he's not, uh, he's not discussing anything with anyone about money, but uh, <laughs> it is super cool to have a, a, a House Armed Services Committee professional staff member living next door so we can work out a few things while we try to fix our lawns and landscaping. <laughs> uh, Jay, thanks for being here. Uh, a sh quick shout out to Christie's in Institute for Defense Analysis, our IDA teammates. Allison Orna, thanks for being here. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, a little about this space, Boomer touched on it earlier, but the term hero gets tossed around a little bit loosely sometimes, but not in this room. This is the space where we remember the more than 3,500 recipients of the nation's, nation's highest honor for valor. If you've ever read some of the citations outlining the actions that lead to awarding of this medal, you'll find they always describe selfless acts that save countless brothers and sisters in arms, usually under extreme enemy fire and against long odds. Around 20% of the awardees receive the award posthumously. If you have a few moments afterwards, Please take a look at the exhibits here in the hall. They are truly heroes. Okay, two brief, brief pieces of TAC admin. Number one, we're blessed with all your presence today. Time may forbid me from going around the entire room. I'm gonna give it a shot and sharing a personal story about everyone here. If I miss someone, let's agree to share it at Maddie, Maddie and Eddie's over beer afterwards. And number two, please forgive me if there's an emotional moment or two. I'm admittedly a bit of a crier. Zoe and I just watched The Sandlot the other day, and I, it, you know, I, I, it, I get cracked up every time when, you know, Benny the Jet, he takes the new kid in the neighborhood, Smalls under his wing, he, the kid can't play baseball at all, and that's all that they do. And, you know, remember when he spits on the ball and hits the perfect fly ball right into his glove and gains his acceptance? Well, that's the kind of stuff that cracks me up. So if I... <laughs> If I lose it a little bit today, my apologies, I'll do my best. Um, as I contemplated, contemplated remarks for today, I thought about uh, a leadership lesson quietly learned from the chaplain at Naval Amphibious Space Coronado when I was in pre-com training a few years back. Chaps had done a lot of time with the Marines, and he learned to keep his messages uncomplicated in his weekly homily, homilies. His sermons always had a single, simple theme that you could remember all week long. What a concept. Um, but the, the, the key point being you remembered it. Now, it also makes us think of this excellent piece of public speaking advice from those who preach from the pulpit. Few sinners are saved after the first 20 minutes of a sermon. <laughs> uh, I don't think we're going to go Republican National Convention length, but uh, <laughs> it, in any case, uh, there is a single theme for today, and it's one word, grateful. Uh, today is not about me. I hate talking about myself. I hate few things more than all the planning and man hours it takes to put something like this together. The pomp and circumstance, dress uniforms, awards, honors and ceremonies. I hesitate to call these nonsense, but uh, my favorite ceremonies over the years have been the ones done at sea. 
you know, uh, uh, where you get the change of command or the promotion done and the, you know, the Navy gets back to its work. And uh, I've, I've been fortunate to do a couple of those over the years. The bad part is your family can't be there, but uh, those are the ceremonies I really like. In any case, I'd have, I'd, I'd have preferred to quietly walk away, but I realized, based on some great advice from several people in this room, I couldn't end this journey without taking the occasion to recognize Christy, Jake, and Zoe for their service alongside me. Today is absolutely about them and all they've sacrificed to support my career. A brief moment to ex uh, mention our extended families. Christy's family uh, is primarily from the greater Chicago area. Uh, we lost her mom, Nancy, while we were dating uh, in the late 90s. Grandpa Mike is a Navy vet and still kicking, living in uh, Christy's childhood home in Schaumburg. I'm the second son of four boys from Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin, the son of Rod and Marion Schleiss. I grew up working for my dad in his plumbing business, so naturally I would you know, join the Navy and serve for 35 years, right? <laughs> um, but uh, you know, sadly, after good lives in, deep into their 80s, uh, we lost both mom and dad in the last year. Uh, but their spirit of patriotism and service is certainly here. And we're excited to see siblings, grandpa, cousins, aunts, and uncles uh, this coming weekend as we head to Wisconsin for our annual uh, family reunion get together. Uh, so we're all looking forward to that. So we've come to the end of a 39 year journey, four years of ROTC and 35 active duty. It's when I started as a somewhat shaky haired um, yeah, uh, midshipman at Marquette University in the summer of 1985. I had to report to school a couple weeks early uh, for ROTC orientation and uh, yeah, you know, the buzz cut, a mildly terrifying uh, first marching session with Staff Sergeant Renna, US Marine Corps. And a couple thousand push-ups later, I wondered what I got myself into. I, you know, I, the, um, I, I mean, I, I remember very clearly thinking, so this is college, getting screamed at by strangers? For, uh, this has got to get better. And of course it did. Um, I came to tolerate ROTC. I absolutely love sailing on our unit's 43-foot sailboat on training cruises around the Great Lakes. I've been sailing since age six, uh, mostly on dinghies in the waters of my hometown. Uh, but the opportunity to race a big boat in college was uh, irresistible. Uh, over the years, I've been asked if I've ever been scared at sea. The only time is in thunderstorms on the Great Lakes with lightning flashing all over with a 70-foot metal pole sticking up in the air <laughs> on your boat. Um, but uh, my best memories of Marquette uh, remain my fantastic circle of friends, most of whom I hope to see more in retirement as I and attend their frequent golf outings and get-togethers in the Midwest. I knew I was hooked on the Navy uh, when I went on third-class cruise. USS Spartanburg County, LST 1192, not a very sexy summer cruise, some might say, but um, I, I had the time of my life. I met the ship in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, as it was doing workups for deployment, and joined deck division, deck, third, division, uh, third Division Deck Department and, uh, and just had the time of my life. Swab and decks, we were in charge of pulling up the brow with the block and tackle before every underway and standing deck watches. I got qualified helmsmen and then got to oversee the seamen on board that couldn't figure out why the big compass went this way and the small compass went that way. <laughs> he couldn't keep the ship on course, so I had to supervise him after I got qualified helmsmen. Um, I still remember my running mate, BM2 Dominic Del Molin. Uh, a, 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 a sharp sailor took me under his wing and showed me deck plate leadership in action. He wouldn't be the last mentor I had, but I'm grateful for him helping me see the Navy through the eyes of a blue jacket and for getting a rising third class midshipman off on the right foot. I graduated from Marquette in spring of 89 and spent that first summer with one of the best jobs I've had teaching sailing to midshipmen on our, uh, on our sailing yachts. Our, our boat, our, the big boat had been sold, so the number one job we had was to fly to Annapolis, spend about a month prepping a boat and sailing it back to Milwaukee. Uh, that, there's about a thousand sea stories associated with that trip that uh, we can share later. But uh, among other things, sailing teaches you respect for the sea. And I'm grateful for all of my, the time that I got, got to sail sailboats prior to the Navy and then in the Navy. <clears throat> After Swastock and Steam Yale schools, I reported to USS Flint. Yeah, again, not a very sexy set of orders, but you know, every ship is full of opportunities to lead, to lead and learn. 
deployed with independence, the other independence, not the LCS strike group, and yeah, that deployment became Desert Shield. Uh, it, we were supposed to pull into uh, Diego Garcia later the, uh, one morning, and I, I remember being in, uh, getting ready for the day in my sta uh, stateroom, shaving or something, and all of a sudden the ship made a fairly sharp turn to the right that shouldn't have happened. And sure enough, a little while later, the captain got on the 1MC and said, uh, Iraq has invaded Kuwait. Our plans have changed. And that yeah, became Desert Shield. Some fairly tense moments there about what that would become. And of course, uh, you know, it ended up being Desert Storm and, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 you know a, a very big operation. But um, yeah, and then that led, led itself to almost my entire first year on the ship deployed. Um, which means lots of chance to get quals done. So that was great, and I love the port visits, all the sea time, port visits to Hong Kong, Bali, Australia, and, uh, and other places. I'm grateful for three things from this tour. My sailors, who I learned from in three divisions across 37 months, my great friend and uh, roommate Dan Rosen, and especially my first chief, ENC Tom Weston, an amazing leader. He actually made LDO before he left the ship, and uh, man, this was the first chief that you want. So grateful for him. <clears throat> yeah, I reported to Antietam next in Long Beach. Yeah, got to do the deployment and that awesome 10 month, uh, I, I got asked to extend to be the overall coordinator. Um, but I'm grateful for CEOs Greg Hansen and Jolie Frank, XO Bob Aldani, department heads Rich Havo, Vic Mercado, Dan Schaefer, who's here, John Yule, my roommate Chuck Payne, Stowe Keith Rhodes, and everyone who helped teach me what it took to lead and succeed in the Aegis Navy, then still fairly new. And Tina Meta is still at a new car smell. She's about five years old then. Amazing. Um, as Admiral Boxel mentioned, the surface Navy was short on department heads, so after some arm twisting from Millington, they got me to go straight back to sea uh, on the condition that I take precom, I get, would get a precom DDG. That led to my assignment to Hopper Bath, at Bath Ironworks in Maine, and of course, that was a life-changing moment. I'm grateful for my COs, Tom Carney and John Peterson, exo Bob Kerno, Department Hill School classmate and fellow parrot head, Jim Campbell, which I, Jim's here, so there he is. What's up, Jim? Uh, best of buddies. And for all the sailors, I learned so much aboard uh, for, from and Hopper. A Hopper commission in San Francisco was home ported in Pearl, and uh, I served aboard for nearly five years. Uh, yeah, the great Millington hookup, uh, you know. <laughs> Let's just make that department a tour. This, typically 36 months, and I did, yeah, almost, almost, uh, well, almost five years. Um, but a, a great tour in Hopper, you know, the first two deployments, firing more than 30 Tomahawks as part of Operation Desert Fox on the ship's first cruise. And of course, my best takeaway from that tour sitting right there. That's where I met Christy. Uh, yeah, Admiral Boxel shared parts of the story of our wedding. Uh, it was long scheduled for May 6, 2000 in Annapolis. And it, if you want to get married at the, at, well, the chapel's a whole nother can of worms, but the first thing you need to do is about two years out, book where you want to have the reception, which we had done. We were on it. We were way ahead of the game. And then, yeah, within about a week's time, my PRD shifted uh, you know, four months to the right, and then the ship's deployment moved uh, three months to the left. So I was going to be deployed for our deployment. In fact, I did leave on deployment and then flew home from Darwin to make my wedding from Darwin, Australia. So, and I owe this uh, a great debt of gratitude we owe to John Peterson, um, who I happily just learned is teaching seamanship training in, down in Mayport now and just, just taught... Uh, uh, Jeremy's wardroom in the past couple weeks here, but um, his, uh, you know, I, I'd have missed the ceremony if it weren't for him, and he made it happen. And, you know, the, the uh, Christy recounted the details in her first published work in Chicken Soup for the Military Wife's Soul, if you want to read about it. Um, but Captain Peterson's unspoken message was unmista unmistakable. The foundation of leadership lies in taking care of your people. We would never forget it. By this point, Christy had completed her active duty commitment, and I'd finally taken shore assignment at N86, then led by Rear Admiral Mike Mullen, and us new newlyweds settled into our Crystal City apartment. It was a seven minute walk door to door from there to the building here, and uh, awesome, two years. And we got new orders at 10 months. 
back to see. Uh, but you know, there's always a silver lining, and this is uh, and and uh, Admiral Boxall mentioned it. This is where I met Dave Steindl, uh CEO of John Paul Jones, and 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 eventually Roy Kitchener, uh, who just just retired as swole boss. Um, if if this were golf, this was consecutive holes in one. Um, Dave, you've been a cherished mentor and life coach for more than 20 years. You and Patty showed us how to build a team. Your relaxed and fun social events at your place brought the wardroom and spouses together. You taught me that normally dreaded shipyard periods can actually be times of you know, growth and fun, and you can get out on time too. Uh, it, you know, if you just if you lead with the positive, uh, you take a positive approach with the shipyard and with your sailors. I just learned so much by watching you in action. I never forgot your last night in command uh, of JPJ. We we're in Port San Diego, and it, the cap. It, normally, you hear the, you know when the captain's leaving because there's four bells. John Paul Jones departing, except but no bells are rung after taps at 2200, 10 p.m. And the captain hadn't left yet, and so I, I was uh, still on board myself. And uh, like, I started poking around, and the quarterdeck watch was like, "Yeah, you no, know, he hasn't left." I found out a little bit later on he was just walking the decks. He, he was out visiting with the sailors, spending some time with the engineers in the in the log room, and uh, you know, for one last time, his last night in command. You know, exor absorbing the sights, sounds, and smells of destroyer John Paul Jones. Command at Sea is a blessing and an opportunity beyond compare. Sir, we're grateful to you and Patty for showing us how to do it right. We lived in Studio City for this tour. Uh, that's a little, you know, of course, it, as, this, as the name implies, if you haven't spent any time in LA, yeah, it was, I, I actually lived on the ship during the weeks and, and uh, drove home on the weekends. But Christy was uh, exploring opportunities, having just gotten her Screen Actors Guild card. And, uh, you know, she had, a little bit of success. It's it's tough sledding. The best stories, though, are probably from uh, her part-time job at a salon in Beverly Hills, where she met several very interesting people. <laughs> Ask her about it afterwards. Brad Pitt was one of them. Um, uh, Dave was, and I think still is, a detailer. Uh, set his core. So naturally, yeah, orders to Millington followed, um, and. Admiral Box already hit this, but I, I, this was the maybe the most incredible wardroom ever assembled in history. I, I think you call it a who's who, a murderer's row of uh, incredible swoes, but Dan Holloway, Tony Curta, Jim Kilby, Craig Fowler, Gene Black, Dave Welch, Stephen Evans, Scott Serretta, Jim Aiken, Wilson Marks, Rich Brown, Kevin Sweeney, and Charlie Williams, and me, uh, all made flag out of that wardroom. Uh, all, uh, all, that was the group that was detailing all at one time in Millington. Uh, just inc incredible wardroom. We're grateful for this assignment, and particularly to you, Admiral Holloway, for your examples of positive leadership, physical fitness always, and family first. You, Kim, and the five Holloway boys set the tone for a great work and after work environment. We're always grateful. I'd been interested, interested in attending Naval National War College ever since I had read Colin Powell's memoir. And one of the great things about Millington is your detailer works about 10 or 15 steps away from you. So I walked down to Jim Aiken's office and said, on Admiral Holloway's advice, uh, hey, I want to go to National. He's like, no. OK, well, you, we'll talk about some more later. And then, but then I went and wrote my name in the National list on his whiteboard. <laughs> It's funny, all the other, I got to National and all the other services have this elaborate selection process to get those billets. I, and they asked what our process was and I said, uh, dry erase marker? <laughs> um, but yeah, so we got to go to National, uh, amazing year there. Got to meet General Powell and President Bush 41 in person. They both came to speak with our class. And the best arrival of all was Jake. Uh, Jake was born in November of 2005. I'm not sure where the time went, but our little man is now two inches taller than me and <laughs> headed to college in a few weeks. More on Jake in a moment. We're so, super proud of you, bud. Uh, okay, based on emergent fleet needs, our command assignment to Decatur switched to Halsey on short notice. And yeah, Jake was about seven months old. We were getting ready to make the cross country move to San Diego, and then I got, had to report on about a six day timeline. So the move plans were off. 
It, incidentally, isn't it funny that we call them permanent change of station orders? For the Navy spouses out there, what the hell is permanent about it? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's some kind of oxymoron or something. But um, in any case, uh, again, every challenge is an opportunity. Yeah, the Halsey CEO had been relieved early due to this engineering casualty, and so they needed a new guy. I was the, I was the, I was the choice, and uh, thankfully, Grandpa Mike and Auntie Karen stepped up, helped Christy do the move, uh, and. Um, and with the little man, and eventually we settled in San Diego and Coronado. Uh, our, you think about that first underway in command. You know, you're going to be steaming out to sea, you know, rolling deck under your feet, wind blowing through your hair. Mine was at midnight, dead stick, meaning the engineering plants completely shut down, backwards from a berth at Naval Station San Diego down the channel and right into the dry dock. <laughs> where we were then sat for, uh, what, four or five months getting a reduction gear replaced, which is a 63-ton piece of equipment that the ship is kind of built around. You set it in with a crane. You don't bring it in later. And uh, yeah, so that was a big job, a big repair. Um, but you know, again, a great challenge. I was super uh, blessed with my Commodore, Mike Gilday, uh, who was incredibly supportive, although he was gone on out deployed on the carrier most of our tour. But uh, you know, our best memories of Halsey are our crew's resilience and getting the ship back to sea after this major engineering casualty. The crew's heroic actions, uh, they sa we saved a Mexican fisherman who was, had been adrift on a piece of wreckage for we don't know how many days. Uh, I think the days uh, kind of lose meaning after a little while, but his, his, he was on a shrimping boat that had sunk. Uh, off the coast of Baja, California, and my team spotted him a little bit after sunset, uh, I mean, against long odds, and we were able to rescue him. Uh, I remember Doc calling up a couple times through the night saying, this isn't looking too good. He, I mean, he hadn't had any food or water for five days, uh, and, but he made it. And uh, yeah, pitting Navy achievement medals on that, uh, that group of sailors that saved uh, that father of five was, uh, was pretty amazing. And then, of, of course, uh, we already talked about First Friday Open Houses. We had a great wardroom, and uh, it, it was super, super good times. It's always gratifying to see your best junior officers succeed in the Navy, and we were blessed with several rock stars. Doug Robb, who just completed, completed Command of Spruance. J. Robb, currently in Command of Kearney. Uh, here today, just back from an incredible deployment. We're so proud of you, brother. Uh, you're grateful for you making the trip, your participation today. And my advice to all is get an autograph while they're still affordable. <laughs> this guy's going to be charging Pete Rose prices soon. Um, amazing work, J. Rob. Okay, we headed back to the Pentagon on behest of the, my detailer, John Esposito. Yeah, we wanted to go to Northcom. Chrissy was dying to do something else in DC. John's like, nope. So joint staff, uh, but a great tour here. And the best part was the arrival of Zoe, who came home on Mother's Day 2009. On to major command next, uh, back, to, back in San Diego. Again, now finally we're going to be somewhere, PCS, permanent change of station for three years. We'd never done anything for more than about maybe two. Uh, but this was going to be our three-year tour. We we're so psyched. We love San Diego. We're living in Coronado. Um, and uh, yeah, deployed on Reagan, Operation Tomodachi, uh, a really good deployment. Um, yeah, and then we started hearing these waterfront rumors. So there's going to, Desron's moving to San Diego, uh, Singapore. Yeah, and I was like, no, well, it's, nobody's told me. It's not us. Um, I, I think I heard about it at a SWO join up or something. And I'm like, yeah, what are you talking about? Um, yeah, fast forward and yeah, three years in uh, San Diego. Uh, you know, turned into 18 months, maybe, and uh, off we were to Singapore. I remember very clearly uh, a conversation with Christy as we were dating and starting to get more serious. Um, you know, a Naval Academy grad, I don't think she was really all that psyched about this being a Navy spouse thing, uh, but she was kind of coming around to the idea, and she, she said, at one point she said, okay, I guess I'm in for this, but I am not going overseas. 
Well, we didn't really have a really didn't have a choice in the matter. Now, right? Uh, you're going to Singapore. It was a it was a mid tour move. Millington had nothing to do with it. Uh, yeah, it wasn't negotiated orders. It was you're going. So, um, yeah, a little bit of a scary time, but Singapore was amazing. Um, you know, the, the travel, the the uh, the ops out there it was fantastic. We had a great tour out there. Um, the you know, and and again another amazing wardroom. Uh, grateful to serve with more fantastic JOs. Bill Blodgett, uh, the SWO of the year while he worked at Desron 7. Uh, Kaylee Snyder, who's about to fleet up the command of, of Russell. Jim Hagerty, Emily's here. Jim is the EA at Surfland now and just finished up his command tour in Bainbridge. And um, Justin Bumara is also here, just finished up command of Stockdale. Matt Swenson also went to command. Amazing wardroom. And maybe best of all, uh, you know, the best deputy, I mean, is this guy really a deputy to anybody? Fred Kacher. Um, we were backyard neighbors and became best of friends with Fred and Pam and their girls. So uh, just an amazing tour at, in, in Singapore. Uh, our, our CTF 73 bosses, Tom Carney, Cindy Tabo, and Charlie Williams here today, uh, all A+. Plus. Uh, Patrick and Sapna Lahi for great friends there. Uh, hey, Patrick, what's going on? How those how those uh, guardians looking? Um, about as good as the Browns. He's, that guy's all things Cleveland. If you want to talk it up, um, but after every great operational tour, a dimly lit cubicle awaits somewhere. <laughs> so back to uh, back to N ninety six N ninety six Charlie. This time it was three years. Uh, and uh, you know, and an op opportunity to work for Swole Powerhouses, Tom Roden, Pete Fanta, and my one-star commissioning officer, Ron Boxel. Uh, so yeah, a, another great tour. Uh, also got the chance to work with Mike Wheels Wheel Dryer. So Wheels, go pack. Um, Tom Halverson and Brian O'Donnell both here, uh, and another another amazing uh, an embarrassment of Swole Riches. Um, but uh, and oh. And then this guy named John Hoopman came on the scene, then a brand new uh, SES, uh, and now twice promoted to N9B. John, thanks for being here. Uh, for some reason, John's left me twice. Um, he, I was at N96, he was my B code, and oh, he's getting promoted, he's gonna go to N9IB. So uh, fast forward a little bit, oh, I'm great, I'm going to N9I, and then, you know, I was there for like, I don't know, three months, and John left again to be Admiral Pitts's uh, B code. So, but that means he's been promoted twice because of the rock star that he is. John, uh, thanks for everything. You and Erica are our are, uh, are, are Navy building royalty, and uh, it's been amazing working with you and, and you know, trading ideas. He, John's one of the guys that he's always got the building perspective, and then I come in with these crazy ideas from the fleet, and you know, he'll tell me 74 reasons why that won't work. And, but we meet in the middle and, uh, and, and try to do the best thing. So, um, but thanks for everything, John. We lived in Vienna for this tour and couldn't have been more blessed to have the Camdar family move in up the block uh, a little while after we moved in there. Uh, uh, amazing friends, one of Jake's best buddies, Aiden there. Um, just great friends. Uh, thanks, thanks, guys, for everything. We miss you. We miss our days in Vienna. Uh, uh, I already shared the, uh, here, I gotta skip ahead here a bit. Um, oh, I, I shared a bit of the, uh, I'm not going overseas piece, but yeah, we make flag and uh, yeah, I remember we, we were at some little conference here in town and Swole Boss Roden pulled me to the side at, during, during the break in the coffee mess and he goes, hey Pablo, <laughs> you know, a list is coming out in a, in a day or two. I'm like, yes sir, and he goes, what do you think of Bahrain? And I'm like, I'm worldwide deployable, sir. He's like, bullshit. <laughs> that, wh what if Christy was here? What would she say? She, I said, she'd say the same thing. And he goes, well, it doesn't matter because you're going. <laughs> um, but yeah, first uh, first flag tour in, in Bahrain. A and yeah, behind Admiral Black, uh, you know, huge shoes to fill, uh, but an empty chair. Um, yeah, I, I remember I had to get, it was like, you gotta get out of here, you gotta get out of here. We got these three days to turn over, you were getting ready to get on the rotator to come back. And so I hustled out there, I remember it was 4th of July weekend, and I roll into the headquarters, and I'm like, hey, it's, I'm right here to see Admiral Black. Oh, he's not here. Oh, is he at home? No, he's back in the States. 
uh, his daughter's wedding or something. So yeah, um, I don't know. That was never completely explained, but um, I, I got there when you told me to get there, sir. So um, yeah, had a great turnover with the deputy or the the, the reserve uh, the reserve vice commander, and uh, I, I think I think Gene showed up for like two hours. Yeah, you, the two-hour special is what you get. Is that what you got? About an hour. But yeah, another amazing tour. Super busy. Christy, I says she was single parenting during that time because uh, it was early, early mornings and late nights, all the time, six days a week at least, sometimes more. But um, yeah, we did live on the beach. I think it's still Zoe's favorite place we lived. Um, yeah, we had a, a brand new puppy, Wrigley, and he loved. Uh, being on the beach and paddle boarding with us and so we had as much fun as we could and we're grateful for the opportunity to serve alongside three amazing fleet, fleet commanders uh, Long and Laura Aquilino, Sterno and Shelly Sterney and Jim Kim Malloy uh, just an, uh, amazing leaders all of you and uh, we're also grateful to the Andros, the Tryon and I think Brent might have made the long, where are you Brent? There he is. Might have made the longest trip to be here but do we have to give you credit for coming from Belgium, or? Sure. He's, uh, but they're, they're a Dodea family, both of them teach, and they were teaching at the Bahrain School at the time, and uh, our kids were about the same age and became fast friends. I know great friends of the Blacks as well, and um, yeah, and you know, Brant made the trip up from, from Florida. I guess they're on summer break in Florida. Uh, we also had the opportunity to serve with the Holmes family, who's also here, came up from Norfolk. Um, so thanks all for traveling. The, the Navy family in Bahrain is tight-knit, and it, you all made this serving in this busy, usually hot, sometimes uncertain theater, not just bearable, but fun. Our last operational assignment, command of Dwight D. Eisenhower Ike Strike Group, was an opportunity I had only dreamed about. The chance to work with 6,000 sailors, eight aircraft squadrons, and seven ships of the strike group from flagship Ike was an amazing, amazing challenge and constant joy. Admiral, Admiral Boxall already covered some of our busy schedule, but yes, that was the COVID deployment. Uh, we had this incredible port visit schedules uh, uh, all set up and didn't stop once. 208 days at sea. Uh, I left toward the end, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, the, 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 well, the ship left from berth 12 at Naval Station Norfolk and came back. That was their next time pierside. Uh, and, it, you know, you'd think that might be, uh, you know, fodder for a, a really tough deployment. Um, it was incredible how that crew on Ike and across all the ships, I got to go and visit all of them, whistling while they worked the whole time. And uh, it's a testament to the leadership of guys like Ike CO, Banjo Higgins. I got to fly with Christie's classmate, our keg, Trevor Estes, and uh, jump out of helos with the EOD team. We crossed the line with 4,000 wa 4, wogs on board Ike. Interesting day. I, you know, we had, did swim call. I got to jump off Elevator 3 a couple times. And it just a, a, a fantastic tour, uh, the time of my life. Uh, and then, once again, back to that dimly cubicle. Actually, a pretty nice office, but the Surface Warfare Directorate. Back to DC. Uh, Kind of my dream shore job, but this was great duty, duty doing critical work for our future. You could ask current director Bill Daly, I saw you sneak in, Bill. Awesome, doing great work for Team SWO. Former directors Gene Black and Ron Boxall are both here, uh, and Team 96 under leadership of Vice Admiral Pitts mm -hmm. and Admiral Skillman are making game changing, multi billion dollar decisions on the shape of the Navy for decades to come. We have the right team on this huge responsibility. The opportunity to work for CNOs Gilday and Franchetti, Vice Chiefs Lesher, Franchetti, and Kilby, and among my high nine mates, uh, Bill, Fred, Buzz, Mark, and more, B codes, John Hoopman and Brad Neff, and so many great teammates has been beyond tremendous. I did a strategy job for about a year at N72, and then onto my current duties as at 9I, uh, and a nice pump here, geographically stable, PCS. Uh, and living in our great house in Alexandria. Uh, more importantly, although Bishop Ireton was Jake's sixth school in nine years, we've been able to anchor here for all four years of high school for Jake, and now for Zoe as well. On the subject of Bishop Ireton, I have to mention our crew family. As Jake began rowing freshman year, we quickly, quickly realized this was an all-in sport. Anytime not spending time, 
anytime not spending driving three or four hours to stand in the rain and mud next to a river all day to catch about 30 seconds of a race <laughs> as your kid goes by. Uh, it, any time that you're spending, not spending doing that is time available for fundraising, right? <laughs> you know, wreath sales, mulch, uh, yeah, running the, the concessions at the football game. But it was a labor of love every step of the way. And we're fortunate to have our, some of our BI crew family here, the Gorskis and the Plunkets. Thanks for being here, guys. Lots of fun. Okay, here's the tough part. Zoe, our Zoe bug, as we watched you grow from cute daughter and kid sister into beautiful young woman, we're perpetually awed, awed by your kindness, empathy, and constant willingness to lend a helping hand around the house, in the neighborhood, at school, or wherever you are. You selflessly volunteered to travel with your parents to be present for impossibly tough family challenges over the past couple of years and served as a kind shoulder a warm hug and a pillar of strength for grieving family members struggling through tough times. You can c continue to define your fun and funky style and we love it that it's 100% you. Your sense of humor and propensity to memorize favorite movie lines from family faves such as the Monty Python films, The Princess Bride, Rango and The Big Lebowski endear you to me particularly as a fellow connoisseur of movie lines. <laughs> You're a driven student who we know will continue to improve as you develop, refine, and pursue your goals through the rest of your high school journey and beyond. Thank you, Z, for your love and support of my career and for every moment of your 15 years. Never, ever lose that kind heart of yours. It's your best quality, and our world needs more people like you. I love you. Jake, we beamed with pride as you finished high school strong this past spring, graduating summa cum laude from Bishop Ireton with five varsity letters in crew and swimming, the Chinese Language Excellence Award, and an awesome stable of great friends. Your volunteer work, both locally on trips and on trips with your class to the Dominican Republic, Haiti, and Camden, New Jersey, underscored your commitment to always thinking about those who have less than you and doing your part to lift up those in need. Your college search process was comprehensive, occasionally stressful for all of us, but we're confident you've made the right choice in Florida State. We know you're primed to excel there as you expand your studies, get new perspectives on life outside your beloved basement man cave, <laughs> and build out a completely new circle of friends. Your long-term commitment to your Mandarin studies and all-around excellence in academics will serve you well going forward. We look forward to many visits to Tallahassee and a great Seminole football season this fall. Most of all, we're so proud of the smart, handsome, principled young man you've become. Thanks for putting up with all the moves and the time away over the years of my career. I love you, bro. I'm grateful for you. Go Seminoles. <laughs> Christy, my partner, my best friend, my love. There are no words to adequately thank you or begin to capture. All you've meant to and continue to be, mean to me and our family. A million different paths could have caused us to never meet, but the Navy brought two Midwesterners together in Maine, of all places, and a lifetime partnership began. First at long distance, through lots of deployments, the gut-wrenching loss of your mom, far too young, an incredible wedding in Annapolis, different jobs and career paths for both of us, 13 moves together, including two overseas and back, the births of two amazing kids, adding our fun, impetuous, and sometimes misbehaving pups to the house, countless great times with friends and shipmates, too numerous to count. I could go on, on and on, but I will stop there to say that none of it would have any meaning without being able to share it with you. It's not possible that God wasn't involved in some small way to make our paths cross in Maine because I can't imagine a more perfect person to walk through life with. 
God truly blessed the broken road that led me straight to you. We stand today at something of a crossroads with Jake heading off to school and me beginning a new phase of the work part of our lives. But we're blessed with so man many fantastic constants to help us through the change. I'm grateful for you and I love you with all my heart. Our life journey is far from complete, hopefully. <laughs> and I look forward to every day of it that I get to spend with you. Okay. Thank you. All right, there's 35 years and I don't know, 30 or so minutes. Um, I'll close with a short piece from a song some of you may recognize. So many nights I just dream of the ocean. God, I wish I was sailing again. Yesterday's over my shoulder. I can't look back for too long. There's just too much to see waiting in front of me, and I know that I just can't go wrong. Once again, thank you for being here today. May God bless you all the United States Navy and our great nation. Thank you. I will now read my orders. CNO Order 0884, Retirement Orders for Rear Admiral Paul J. Schleiss, United States Navy. Your transfer to the retired list is approved, effective 1 October 2024. You will be transferred to the retired list in the grade of Rear Admiral. Detached in September 2024 from Director, Integrated Warfare, and 9I. You are relieved of all active duty, effective 2359, 30 September 2024. Signed, Lisa M. Franchetti. Admiral United States Navy, Chief of Naval Operations. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, Commander Jeremy J. Rob Robertson, Commanding Officer, USS Kearney, DDG 64. Read the watch. For 35 years, this sailor has stood the watch. While some of us were in our bunks at night, this sailor stood the watch. While some of us were in school learning our trade, this shipmate stood the watch. Yes, even before some of us were born into this world, this shipmate stood the watch. In those years when the storm clouds of war were seen brewing on the horizon of history, this shipmate stood the watch. Many times he would cast an eye ashore and see his family standing there, needing his guidance and help, needing that hand to hold during hard times, but he still stood the watch. He stood the watch for 35 years. He stood the watch so, so that we, our families, and our fellow countrymen could sleep soundly in safety each and every night, knowing that a sailor stood the watch. Today, we are here to say, shipmate, the watch stands relieved relieved by those you have trained, guided, and led. Shipmate, you stand relieved. We have the watch. Very well. Rebel will now present the flag to his family. The flag was flown over the Pentagon on 15 July 2024.
Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the benediction and departure of the official party. Let us pray. Lord, for what our eyes have seen, for what our ears have heard, for what our hearts have felt, we say thank you. Lord, as the Schleiss family prepares to begin a new chapter of their lives, we pray, Lord, that you will remind them that just as you have been with them in the past, you will be with them in the present and in the future. God, we pray that you will make your path plain to them, that they may feel your goodness in everything that they do. Now, Lord, we ask for you to bless them and keep them in your care both now and forevermore. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's ceremony. Thank you for attending. Please join the Fight Slice Schleiss family for a reception in the foyer in the rear hall. All of you are also invited to join the Schleiss family at Maddie Nettie's. Uh, sure, most of you know where that's at. Over at Pentagon Row at 1700. Thank you. Thank you.